I'm going to talk about automated software defect prediction using machine learning. First, what is software defect prediction? Well, as you know, software is composed of several components. This could be, for example, several different classes or several different uh, methods. And testing all these components can be quite expensive. If we know beforehand which components of our software are more likely to contain defects, then we can concentrate more of our testing on these components and in this way increase testing cost effectiveness. And um, sorry, my presentation was originally prepared in Keynote. Um, this was converted to PDF and originally I thought I would be able to use my own laptop for the presentation, but actually no, so bear with me. <laughs> Um, okay, so software defect prediction is concerned exactly with that. It's concerned with identifying which components of our software are likely to be faulty. And how to, to do that? Well, we can create predictive models to tell us which uh, components are likely to be faulty by using machine learning approach. This machine learning approach can learn from repositories of previous releases of our software, plus the bug information that we have from these previous releases. And uh, you can learn from that and build a predictive model. Once we have this predictive model and we get our new release of the software, we can inquire this predictive model so as to which components are likely to be defective. Okay. In order to use this machine learning approach, we need to convert our repository, which contains uh, data on previous releases of our software, into a format um, that is suitable for these learning machines to perform learning. This frequently uh, involves transforming our code into vectors. Each one of our components of our code would be transformed into a vector of input features and a target class. These input features could be, for example, branch count, which is the number of branches that you have in your component, uh, the number of lines of code that you have in your component, how static difficulty, this is a measure of the difficulty to understand this code based on the number of operators and operands that you have in your component, psychomatic complexity, um, this is a measure of complexity of the code in terms of the number of different paths that you can have in your component, uh, and so on. The target class is basically a label which tells whether this component was defective or not in your previous release. One of the, of the advantages of converting your code to this format is that it's actually quite quick and uh, automatically done. We, you can uh, automatically make this conversion as long as you uh, implement the conversion. It's done automatically. So now I'm going to talk about one example of learning machine that can be used for that. Uh, this learning machine is called Naive Base. How many of you here are familiar with machine learning? Two, three, oh, okay, good. Um, Right, I selected here one of the simplest um, learning machines uh, that we can um, have. Uh, this learning machine, despite being simple, it can achieve reasonably good performance for software defect prediction. There are other learning machines that are more complex and they can achieve better accuracy. But this is a good one to start with, uh, especially if you're not familiar with machine learning. So Naive Bayes is based on the Bayes theorem. This Bayes theorem says that the probability of observing um, a certain um, category, which is in our case defective or non-defective, given a certain number of features, I think the battery is going a little bit uh, low. Um, so given these features equals to the uh, probability of uh, seeing this category multiplied by the probability of having these features given uh, the category divided by uh, the probability of observing these features. Now, if we assume uh, that these features here are independent of each other, then 
we can say that the probability of observing a certain category, defective or not defective, given these features, is proportional to the probability of observing this category multiplied by the probability of observing feature 1 given that the class was that class C, um, the category was C, multiplied by the probability of observing feature 2 given uh, that category, multiplied by the probability of feature 3 given that category, and so on. So what the naive base classifier does is whenever we get a new component from a new release of our software, and we want to determine whether this new component is likely or not to be defective, then naive base will calculate this term here of the equation for each one of our possible categories, for faulty and for non-faulty. It will then check which of these two categories has the largest value for this term here of the equation. The one that has the largest value is the category that is predicted. Uh, as the output of our Bayesian model. So, in order to make this clearer, I'm going to give to you an example. Um, let's say that have only two input features, uh, branch count, oh, it's back, branch count and uh, number of lines of code. Um, your target category, whether it's defective or not, and let's say that we had only five components. We are likely in real life to have much more than five, but just as an illustrative example, let's consider that we had five components in our previous release. Then, let's say that we want to classify a new component from a new release, uh, and this new component has branch count 16 and number of lines of code 39. So, how to use my base to determine whether this component is likely to be faulty or not. Well, we have to calculate this term here of this equation for each one of our categories, for defective and for not defective. So let's start first with the category not defective. What is the probability of observing not defective based on our previous release? Well, this probability is 3 divided by 5, because 3 in 5 of our components were uh, non-defective. So this gives us a probability of 0 0.6. Now, uh, what is the probability of having branch count 16, given that the category is not defective? Well, if we do that in the same way as we've done um, this calculation of this probability here, what would we get? Well, now we are considering only the cases that are not defective. So we will look only at these three first uh, lines, uh, three, this, uh, three first vectors of this table. Right? Um, let's consider here, just uh, as an illustration, that this was not 16. Let's say that it was 4. Right? What would we do? Oh, 4 does not appear here. Right? So we have zero cases where the branch count was 4 uh, in three cases. This would give us a probability of 0, right? But this is not really the best way to do that for the input features, because these features are numeric. 4 is actually a value that is quite similar to 5 and is quite similar to 3. So it could actually be quite likely that a non-defective component would have branch count uh, of 4. Right? So we do this in a different way. Going back to branch count 16 now. Um, so what is the probability of having branch count 16 given that the category is no? Well, to calculate this, we use a Gaussian function. This Gaussian is going to give you the probability of uh, observing each one of the different possible uh, values of branch count. This Gaussian function has two parameters. One of them is the mean, and the other one is the standard deviation. So in this case here, for the mean, we are going to use the mean of these three values here of branch count. The standard deviation is the standard deviation of these three values here of branch count. 
So the probability of observing branch count 16, given that uh, our component is not uh, defective, is given by this Gaussian here, and the value is 0 0.0004. Then we do the same thing for lines of cold. We want to know what is the probability of having lines of cold 39, given that our component is not faulty. This probability is taken now from uh, another Gaussian with mean, which is the mean of these three values here, and the standard deviation is the standard deviation of these three values here from our known defective components. This probability is 0 0.0038, right? And, uh, and then we do exactly the same thing, but for the category yes. The probability of observing yes is 2 divided by 5, because we had here two um, examples of defective components in five components, right? The probability of having branch count 16, given that the component is defective, is now taken from these two last rows here of the table, which refer to our defective components from the previous release. So now our mean is the mean of these two values here, and our standard deviation is the standard deviation of these two values here of branch count. Um, so this gives us a probability of 0 0.4385. The probability uh, of lines of code 39, given the category was yes, is calculating the same thing. We take the mean for our Gaussian as the mean of 40 and 35, uh, and the standard deviation of 40 and 35, and then this will give us a probability um, of 0 0.1033. So now that we calculated this term, both for the category yes and the, for the category no, we have these two values here, and we know that this value here is bigger than this one, right? So our naive base classifier is going to predict that this component here is likely to be defective. So, so this is how the naive base classifier works. Um, Weka is an open source software that contains implementations of several different learning machines, including naive base and including other learning machines. Um, I was going to give a demonstration of this tool here, but the demonstration is in my laptop. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, give. But basically, I would show you how to load um, your data set, which represents um, your previous release of the software, and then you can select the naive base classifier to be used. You press a button to start, and this uh, tool would print the model that is created. So you can see this model, you can visualize this model. This tool also allows you to evaluate how accurate this model is for the software that you are developing for which you have this release available. Um, yeah. So, but there are some issues to consider. One of them is uh, the issue of class imbalance. The number of examples of faulty modules or faulty components is usually much smaller than the number of examples of non-faulty components. This could cause some learning machines to tend to classify everything as non-faulty, because most of the information that they got for the learning was non-faulty. So they may tend to simply say, oh, everything is uh, non-faulty. Sorry, everything is non-faulty, because most of the examples that I learned from the past were non-faulty. How to avoid that? Well, one of the strategies is that you can undersample the examples of components from the non-faulty class. Uh, this means that instead of using all the examples from this non-faulty class, you can take a few of them, maybe the same number of examples of the non-faulty class as the ones that you have from the faulty, from the defective class. And this can improve the performance, you can avoid this type of problem that some learning machines can get trapped into. There are other uh, more advanced techniques. Uh, this is a reference to a paper that talks about some of these more advanced techniques, uh, which can achieve um, better accuracy than doing undersampling. 
Um, another issue to consider is data availability. There is no data from a project before its first release is rolled out. So how can you make predictions in terms of the defects for a software that is in, first, in its first version? Right? How to do that? One way to overcome this problem is to use data from other software that you developed. Right? You just have to be careful here because you have to select the part of that software that is most similar to your software that you are developing right now. If you select a software that is completely different from the one that you're developing right now, then your model is not going to work, right? Because it was a completely different software uh, that was used to generate this model. Um, another issue to consider is the temporal behavior. Typically, um, all available examples from components uh, from all previous versions of a software are used to build this fault or defect prediction models. But as we go from one version to another of our software, change may happen. A module that was likely to be faulty in your previous version may not be so likely to be faulty in the new version anymore. How to fix that issue? Here you can try and identify which of the previous versions are most useful for making predictions to your current version. This can basically be done by making comparisons of the input features um, of your previous versions um, in comparison to your current version. This particular issue is pretty much under investigation. It's a very new research topic. There is uh, one work on this uh, published. Uh, to finish this talk, I would like to mention that we are publishing a book on sharing data and models in software engineering. This book contains an explanation of machine learning approach uh, that can be used for several different software prediction tasks, including software defect prediction and other uh, prediction tasks. Uh, this book is to appear by the end of this year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.